Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unlock the Middle podcast, video cast number eight, where we explore and celebrate all that is special about middle school. During this evening's video cast, we hope that our observers out there in virtual land will be able to share thoughts and comments via the comment feature that we've got available. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube. Submit those comments, and we'll be sure to monitor them and try to get them up on the screen and at least ask the questions that are commonly themed. Be sure to check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Unlock the Middle. I'm your co-host, Chris Starcheski, the principal at Dudley Middle School in Dudley, Massachusetts. And I've got my good friend and colleague and co-host, Dean Packard. He's the principal at Charlton Middle School in Charlton, Massachusetts. How are you, Dean? Hey, Chris, I'm doing really well. Thank you so much. I tell you what, what a wonderful week, uh, weekend here up in the Northeast. Right now, we're in the middle of some torrential thunderstorms the rain is pounding down and the thunder and lightning is is all around us but listen we're going to get through this and i gotta tell you chris i was thinking today uh while i had some time to ponder when we're at uh some in between time let's say just thinking about our show and why we do it uh we started this unlock the middle back in july and with the idea of really giving tools to educators and ideas for growth and a platform to help everybody improve. You know, we've really grown a lot since uh, since July in one month. And I'll tell you what, it's been absolutely amazing. The amount of people reaching out to us and wanting to share ideas. And I'll tell you what, tonight's going to be no different. Tonight, we've really tapped into somebody who really is a leader, a pioneer, somebody who can really talk about a set to another level, and I can't wait. This is going to be real exciting, Chris. You're absolutely on point, Dean. I'm going to put up our opening banner to let folks know who we're going to be talking to. Uh, Mr. Rick Wormley is going to be coming into the room in just a moment. Following tonight, though, we've got some great local educators from our from our current schools, Dudley Middle and Charlton Middle School. We've got Maggie Herrick and Tracy Eide from Dudley Middle School. We've got Todd Pelican and Stacey Garropy from Charlton Middle School. We're going to be talking about this juggernaut of a topic, feedback and equity. And we have one of the best ex experts in the instructional world uh, with us tonight to talk to us about that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring him on in, Dean. And, and well, before you do that, well, Chris, why don't you take a second and really look at that bio and really, really build that build that introduction for this guy. He deserves it. We had a great pre pregame talk with him, and I want to make sure that he gets that uh, that introduction that's just going to just go like a drum roll. Let's go. Let's bring it on. All right. Before I hit the adding to stream button, Rick, Rick is one of the first nationally board certified teachers in America. Rick brings innovation, energy, validity, and high standards to both his presentations and his instructional practice, which include 39 years of teaching math, science, English, phys ed, health, history. And he's been a coach to teachers and principals in innumerable uh, numbers. Rick's work has been reported in numerous media, including ABC's Good Morning America, Hardball with Chris Matthews, National Geographic and Good Housekeeping, Magazines, What Matters Most for the Teaching for the 21st Century, and The Washington Post. He's a columnist for the AMLE Magazine and a frequent contributor to ASCD's Education Leadership Magazine. He's the author of an award-winning book, Meet Me in the Middle, as well as best-selling books, Day One and Beyond. My Bible when I was going in as a principal in a standards-based middle school, fair isn't always equal, assessment and grading in the differentiated classroom. And don't forget his second edition of fair isn't always equal. These are always on the corner of my desk and always being opened. He's got several other books to his credit. In his book, The Collected Writing So Far of Wick Wormley, Crazy Good Stuff I Learned About Teaching Along the Way is a collection of his published articles, guest blogs, and more. His practice is a showcase for ASCD's best-selling series, At Work in the Differentiated Classroom. Welcome to Mr. Rick Wormley. How are you tonight, Rick? Very good. This does conclude our video cast. Thank you so much for that information. Wow. Well, we really appreciate you being here tonight. Absolutely. And uh, the, the years of experience that you've had at, at bringing students into their own uh, and bringing educators into their own is is storied. And I, I have to say, personally, uh, this book has been a significant influence to my practice as well as uh, teachers that I've had the pleasure of mentoring and coaching in my role as an instructional leader. Thanks for very much for everything that you've done. Well, thank you for saying that. I actually wrote that book because I was dissatisfied with my undergraduate program at Virginia Tech 
because they didn't give me a class on that. And I was so worried about assessment and grading. I said, well, then I'll invent it. If they didn't give it to me, I'll do it myself and provide it for others who are struggling just as much as I was. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Rick, you know, one of the things, you know, and I've been a big fan as well. I follow you on social media. You are just out there everywhere and you are just spreading uh, your wisdom and doing a great job. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about tonight was the world we're in today has never been more complex than it ever is at this point in time. In your opinion, how can feedback be structured to address continuous improvement in remote and hybrid learning environments? One of the things that we're really trying to get our, you know, put our thumb on to be able to really help out our educators as we start this new year. So you're asking about how feedback can help with that process? Yeah. Yep. Well, you've got to realize that the normal things we would do in the physical classroom elude us now. We, we don't have that anymore, anymore if we have a hybrid or remote system. And so the kids will have more and more of the burden of monitoring their own learning. And so one of the biggest things we want to emphasize, particularly with middle school and high school, is self-efficacy. I can get, be given the techniques and the tools of how to monitor where I am in relation to a larger goal and then make a decision about what steps I need to take to close that gap. And that's a part of moving kids away from a learned helplessness, because a lot of kids are very stressed about that. And it's very easy to blame circumstance or people in my life when I don't have the exact skills yet to actually you know, guide my own progress. And it moves me away from the need for external validation. We have so many middle school kids, for example, who they post something on social media, and if they don't get 17 likes within five minutes, they enter a depressed state or a zone of anxiety. And they wonder what's wrong with me. Oh no, I don't belong. And belonging is huge to a, to a young adolescent and an adolescent. So we want to be able to empower them with very specific ideas, principles, practices, techniques on descriptive feedback, so they own their learning. And from there, we can minimize cheating, plagiarism, we can increase, oh, I'm in charge of it. And really we're moving towards agency, voice and choice in their own learning. And feedback is just one of the primary tools. In fact, I would say it was the new urgent currency that's gonna allow us to progress if we are on remote instruction, whereas grading falls away, it starts paling in importance and because judgment and evaluation is not there, but diagnosis and then forward movement. Is this advancing me is where it's gonna happen and feedback is the engine that will drive that. But we have to get that in the hands of kids and their parents so they don't over assist. And we realize what we're really doing is we're building the kid so that he can persevere. And I think when you do that, you develop a, a stamina. For teachers, it's a courage of conviction. So if I'm, if I'm struggling with the logistics of how to pull this off instructionally, I will still see it through because I have the courage of the sense of purpose behind feedback to pull that off. And we can get more specific about techniques down the road if you like, but that's, that's my initial response. Thank you. I can't hear you there, Chris. He's doing the, the lips. Oh. <laughs> You think I'd have this uh, video perfect thing down after all the Zoom meetings we've been engaged with? Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, Rick, I really appreciate the uh, perspective on currency. You know, for kids as middle level learners, uh, it's important for us to understand what their currency really is and how we can engage them and fully invest them in the learning process. And and a big part of middle middle school and adolescent development, uh, it, it's centered upon equity and a feeling of inclusivity uh, and connectedness. Uh, with kids. So we were hoping that you could talk a little bit about effective practices that educators can follow in order to ensure that there's equity in everything that they do when they address their students. Man, we could talk for three days just on that alone. So, you know, understand we're just dipping our toes. And I so encourage people to explore this beyond this conversation because it's that vital. Whole futures are at stake in us getting this right from an equity standpoint. And the thing we have to realize is, is really embrace the idea that each one of the individual kids in front of us, whether it be in distance learning or it be physical classroom, is infinitely valuable. Not just the ones that reflect our own culture back to us, our own gender, our own skin color, our own nationality, our own religion, but all of them. And that's the strength of a democracy is that we serve everyone, not just the easy ones that are out there. 
And many times instructional lessons, there are a lot of kids who find it a friendly place and they thrive. But we're really about, if we're accomplished and hopefully versatile and agile in our instructional practice, we deal with all the kids who need more, less, or different. And we don't automatically blame the kid for his or her or their lack of thriving. We look at our decisions as well as what's going on. We don't want to develop a deficit mindset. And then we don't want to give a false sense of, well, I understand exactly where you're coming from. During the pandemic, we have so many different emotional swings and different cycles within a family that once was functional is now dysfunctional because mom or dad have lost their jobs. And so now they're home and that's changed the dynamic in the family and it's become hard. We've had a tsunami, overwhelming amount of development of opioid use nationwide, alcoholism, anxiety, and panic disorders. We have an uneven sleep pattern now too, very intermittent, broken up, not the normal cycles. So if we are, for example, in the classroom and we're doing only synchronous lessons, we're not going to see the best side of the students and they're going to be very concerned about people seeing their family life. So what we're going to do is we're going to think outside the box. We're going to think divergently. How can I get the most effective instruction to students if we're doing remote or hybrid? And then how can I get work back? And then how do I get feedback to them in a timely manner? All the things that we know, but the idea is that we don't sacrifice principles because we can't fathom logistics. We need to think outside the box. I have, um, when I do training for schools these past few months, I have two slides worth of just really cool, creative, innovative ideas. And I'd be glad to send them to anybody who wants it of what schools are doing to do this very thing, to diminish the equitable issues that are happening as best we can. So the idea that, for example, that last year we had a lot of teachers who were doing emergency teaching. They really weren't teaching. It was just emergency teaching. And so they had different levels of talent and skill in delivering remote instruction. Got it. No problem. But a lot of kids didn't learn for whatever was going on in their family or was going on with the teacher, whatever it was. So now more and more middle schools are considering e-portfolios or digital portfolios that your science will follow you through the multiple years of middle school. Your math will follow you. And whatever age you are, you're given credit once you demonstrate evidence of that. So this coming year, and certainly over this summer, every single middle school should allow the kids to resubmit evidence of their learning of the last three months of the previous school year. And the, this year's teachers should have a real mini, I don't know, seminar on last year's curriculum and next year's curriculum. Because when you're really intimate with the curriculum above and below you, even if you're an eighth grade teacher and the students are going to ninth grade, you still sit with the ninth grade teachers and become intimate with what they teach. But when you know those things, you're better able, you're more effective in the current because you know where they came from and you connect where they're going to and you see them as a part of a continuum. Oh, you're here and I'm trying to move you as far as we possibly can. That is far more constructive and mindful of the unequalness, the unevenness of what's going on. And it's a bit of being a pragmatist. And the pragmatist credo is whatever works, man. So <laughs> I teach in the way they learn, not the way I learn or their classmates learn. And I'm not going to have the, the, the mistaken notion that I'm going to blame you and put all the, the burden of your learning on your shoulders when maybe there's some di different things I can do. So if we're into equity, it means we're really very good at coming up with multiple ways to assess the same thing, not chasing compliance. Did you take the test? Did you submit the paper? Did you do the project? Did you create the TikTok that I asked you to do? Whatever it was, it's did you present evidence? And if you didn't present it this way, did you present it that way? And the A for that, the 4.0 is just as legitimate as people who did the regular, more traditional assessment. Because I'm out for you to learn this stuff, not that you did stuff. As you get into this, those are some of the equity things. And then, of course, that we become mini experts in the unique nature of the students we serve. So do, am I up to speed on ADHD and executive function? How about kids who are struggling with trauma? How about kids who are gamers? Can I use it somehow to make learning more you know, meaningful to them? Kids into graphic novels and anime and manga. Kids are struggling with a, a dysfunctional family, homelessness, uh, job loss, whatever it is. Where's the next meal coming from? But also kids who are dealing with racism and classism and genderism and, and sexual orientation challenges. We, I need to actually be knowledgeable about that, not teach blind to the students I serve. So you should be able to ask me if I'm a classroom teacher at any moment, tell me things you know about your kids and how it's affected your instruction and assessment for them in a very positive way. And if you hem and haw and you hesitate, 
I'm going to worry about you. I'm going to ask to have a conversation of, of a greater depth. Does that help? That does. And you're, you're, you're spot on. You know, Rick, if we take it a little bit further, we just talk about student motivation through feedback and equity. How do we how do we tap into that? That's that intangible on the outside to really drive students to the learning. What are some of your thoughts on how how that would look? Well, I think it goes back to something we hear, and that's student agency. Do I feel invested in this? Do I have choice and voice and kind of a modified democracy? So I would expect that kids would be allowed to submit proposals, you know, for how they want to demonstrate mastery. And there, I've never ever had to tone it up. I've always had to tone it down because their eyes are bigger than their stomachs. I love I'm it. Gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, and then we're gonna do like a Hamilton thing, but with math. It's gonna be so awesome with hip hop, and then I'm gonna bring in this. Uh, yeah understand that you have other subjects and you have a life. So I've truly, but when they do that, they remember that learning longer. And one of the things we found is, you know, it, it, when it comes to discipline, you're proactive, interactive, reactive. Proactive is, are you developmentally appropriate for young adolescents? Seriously, circle in your lessons where you are proving to me you have expertise and how a brain learns of a 10 to 15 year old, which is middle school. And, and if you can't show that, I'm going to doubt the lesson's effectiveness. And then interactive. How are you establishing relationships? So students want to move mountains for you, and you'll want to move mountains for them. We, ha You have a seat at learning's table. You belong here, and you have a powerful role in your own learning, that sort of thing. And so how are we going to establish that? And the reactive are your rules and the consequences for breaking them. And so that's you know the part of the discipline side of it. We don't need to go to reactive. We really, truly don't. All the consequences stuff, the punitive things, when we are powerful and interactive and proactive. But a lot of teachers, when I say prove to me or develop me appropriate, they're a little bit, they're scrambling. They're not familiar with this, we believe. Our Turning Points 2000, the Association for Middle Level Education, wonderful resource background, the cadre of folks that will help you out with that. We want to make sure that happens. And then we realize that motivation, a big part of that is meaning making. And many middle school teachers stop at sense making. What are the five protections of the First Amendment? What are the parts of a plant? You know, uh, what's the role of the mantissa in a logarithm? Things like that. And so, okay, I've got the basic idea, but then how do you transform your life with this knowledge? Or how does it connect to something you already know? Could you recode what we're teaching you in terms of something you already find familiar? Or if you learn this skill set in my class, how does it help you do something better in another subject, another class? Subject integration, interdisciplinary teaming. But are you really, and we can look again at your lesson plan, are you doing sense making? That's great, we need it. But can I circle meaning making where students are making connections? And if I can't, that's a problem. One of my favorite ways of doing that is metaphors and analogies. I wrote like an entire book on it. That's the world of cognitive linguistics. But literally in my class over the years, we overtly teach students how to construct your own analogies because everybody's in ceaseless comparison mode. People listening to me and you guys right now are going, well, that's just like, no, that's not like, yeah, we're comparing. So a student who perks up and goes, so when you say geometric plane and I'm the pitcher on a team and the runners run to the bases and I'm on the mound, we're on two different planes. But when the mound is like flat, cause they call it a mound, but really it's just flat with the grass and the runners run the bases, we're on the same plane, right? Yes. He recoded, he found connections. So the use of analogies overtly in math, 90% of math is metaphor. And so many kids don't get the math because they don't get the analogy or metaphor the teacher was using to, to explain this abstract idea. Oh, so <laughs> there's more to, to this stuff becoming vivid, um, anomalies and patterns because middle school kids are pattern seeking and they really perk up when stuff, well, which one of these is not like the other, you know, when one kind of stands out. This is incredible, vital time, even if we know that young adolescents have an addictive nature. The brain is actually very addicted to exercise, to reading, to gaming, and of course to substance abuse if we're not careful. But the brain is just changing so much. We are pruning so much in young adolescents. If things don't get used, then that nerve, that ner neuron system dies away. But we've got all this stuff and we're gonna do reiteration. We don't have to sell it to kids when they are invited into their own learning and they're invested in co-teaching, coming up with another way to assess something. If we're doing a novel study, we let them choose a novel that's contemporary, not just an older novel written only by a dead white guy. You know, we, we're really kind of opening it up. Lots of different ideas there on motivation, but I'll stop and take, let you guys take a breath.
<laughs> Thanks for letting me catch my breath, Rick. My heart's going a mile a minute. You know, as we sit here and we talk about reimagining teaching and learning uh, in the environment that we're in, uh, we're always thinking of ways to be better and ways that we can engage kids at a higher level. And you, you talked, to, you touched on this uh, next point uh, a bit when we were talking about feedback and student uh, student uh, agency. Uh, the whole topic of retakes and uh, you know, uh, diving in, talking about the overall growth for learning as opposed to the uh, expectation of compliance. You nailed that point exceptionally well. What advice would you have for teachers who want to add uh, the idea of retakes to their toolbox? Where well, do they begin? Yeah, well, first of all, spot on. Run, Barry, run, if you're into the flash. Absolutely do that. So the idea is that we're there to engender hope, not play gotcha. And for you to deny a redo goes against everything we know in human psychology. You're really this close to educational malpractice. I'm literally coming to you saying, knock it off. You don't know what you're talking about. So study what we know about how the brain best learns. And you would never have a concern or challenge with redos and retakes. Every single profession, that's how people became competent. They did it a lot and they received critique. People always ask me, well, wait, Rick, a pilot can't redo its la his landings. Yes, he can. Hundreds of times before they're real passengers on the plane. That's how you get good enough to be certified. So you didn't teach once, and that was your quality for the rest of your life. You taught a bajillion times. And if it's the first time you've taught a unit and it's five periods a day, first period is a guinea pig period. And then you get four redos that day. So you are the living proof that this really, really works. One of the cool things you can do in middle school is if you do have five periods a day, then you always change the period that you use to start the next unit. I did that for decades. So I started with period one now, but the next time we start a unit, it's always period two. And then we teach that day, come back the next day. Period one gets the benefit of all the wisdom of mistakes made the day before, right? So we're, we're gonna rotate through that all the way through. So now people have to decide, is incompetence preparatory and maturing? Or would it be better to be competent? Even though the kid was irresponsible, the kid might have cheated and plagiarized. Oh my gosh, does he get a redo? For 100% full credit, not partial credit, not oh, as great you get as a 70, because that's knowingly lying when you distort the truth and you have no moral authority. I have no moral authority to lie to children. So if they, all right, I'll give you half a point for each problem you go back and correct. That's a relearning experience, but that's not a reassessing experience, uh, the final thing. So we'll put all kinds of things in place, but then you redo and you subsequently achieve at a higher level, I give you the higher score. And what we find is reiteration is the way the kids really learn it. And you gotta think, will they be prepared if they went into it incompetent and not learning it? If you say this F on the first go around is permanent, unrecoverable, and that will learn you, you know, admonishing the wag with a wagging finger from afar, you said it's okay for you not to learn this, which is heinous. It's a soft bigotry of low expectations. And you've said that there's no consequence for you not doing it. The consequence for not doing it is doing it. I will haunt your nightmares. I will get in your face and save you from yourself. But there's some teachers who are like, no, he's gonna meet me halfway. I'm not gonna do the work for him. No one's asking you to do the work. What we're doing is, hey, hey could you walk with him on the journey while he does it? He walks side by side and not give up on him and not let his immaturity dictate his destiny. You know, literally, if you just say, oh, well, that's an F, that'll learn you. You said it's okay for him not to learn it. And then he just it enters that terrible sp spiral. So I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to engender hope. And I'm going to realize that iteration is the way anyone becomes competent in anything. So if you ask teachers, what do you want for the students in your class? They usually say to learn it and learn it well and maybe to, to mature or grow up. Great. How do you do that? In probably the top five, I mean, Rick and Becky DeFore, before they passed away, their most recent publications talked about redos and retakes. Every assessment and grading expert in the world, all the cognitive scientists, everybody agrees. But there are people, and I got to be honest, it's people went to college and then right in the classroom. When I work with second career people, every single branch of military service, I have worked with them. They're, they've been in there for 20 and 30 years engineers, scientists, architects, software developers, everyone in the working world that I train 
And then they go into the classroom, totally gets redos and retakes is a part of the scientific process, the mathematical process, how a, a, a soldier becomes confident with, a, with an assault rifle in the field. You do it over and over and over again. You get critique in between, you improve, and then you're a little bit better. Then you get critique from somebody who knows better than you, and you improve, and you get better and better. And better. That's the way you do it. And they look at their colleagues who are denying redos, a scans and say, what are you thinking? This is one of the most preparatory things for the working world there ever was. And so understand, people say, well, it's not fair if they get five iterations, this kid only get one. Look at your definition of fairness. Do not succumb to a childish notion of fairness. You know what that is, right? Uh, everybody gets the same. I got to do this. You get 20 minutes on computer. Everybody's got to get 20 minutes. Yeah, fair isn't always equal. You're exactly right. Fair means you get development money what you need. Whether you need three months more than the rest of your classmates is irrelevant. The gradebook is cumulative for the whole year if I'm living up to the promise of teaching everyone, not just the easy ones. So redos, retakes, relearning in between, and then setting up parameters so the kids don't abuse you, the system, they learn responsibility is absolutely key to a middle level. And in fact, middle level kids are trying to find their voice and their maturity as scholarly students, they're gonna need this or they stumbled on a blind alley. They regroup and they go down another alley and you're there as that NASCAR pit crew to set this up, not gotcha, because you didn't learn in the same timeline, the same manner as everyone else. It's a fundamental mindset through which you see and, and, and really apply everything in instructional design. Rick, I, I gotta tell you, I'm listening to you and I'm just getting all fired up because you just reimagine school. You, you that, that whole mindset is about changing the way we look at some things than what we do today in our practices. And I'll tell you what, these kids' minds are fragile. They want to be, they want to be loved. They want you to walk with them. You are right spot on. And I'll tell you, it's very difficult sometimes for educators to jump in and just make that mindset change. Well, you know what you can do? You can actually ask people, and I do this with all professions, not just teachers, but teachers, it's perfect, and say, how did you learn your craft? And then how are you assessed and evaluated? And you see so many wonderful parallels that go, oh, this is the way to go. But they didn't do that deeper dive. It was a bit of a knee-jerk response. And I'm looking at schools of teacher ed. I'm kind of blaming them. I think every single school of teacher ed, because it's one of the foremost things in our minds as young teachers, or soon to be teachers, a whole year on what do you know about motivation and cultivating self-discipline and moral fiber and getting your act together with executive functions so you meet deadlines, motivation, all of that tenacity, perseverance, stick to -itiveness. And wow, would that be a toolkit that would empower us to do the right thing? So if teachers don't have that background, they tend to rely on Fs and zeros to light fires, which again is a form of malpractice. You know, the, the idea of educational malpractice is one that's very strong. And, you know, we think about it all the time and obviously the medical profession. But when we talk about the development and cultivation of kids and, and what it is that they really need, as we're coming into this school year, they need that connectedness. They need that feeling of inclusivity and engagement with their learning. They need to understand purpose and they need to make connections to their teachers at a high level. You know, with all the talk about you know all the, all the additional acronyms, you know, social emotional learning and SEL, it's absolutely what middle school teachers do. But the the commentary that you provided tonight, Rick, really drives home the idea that when we say that we're students first and we're not compliance first, we need to stop thinking about that compliance attitude. We're not going to get into the idea of the power of the zero tonight because that would take about seven days to go through, uh, but learning for learning's sake is what we need to do and what we need to focus on and that is a drive that i think a majority of educators in our buildings uh, really understand it's a question of having the opportunity and the time to think differently about the teaching and the learning yeah and, and and I think we've got a catalyst for that now yeah that's true and i i just hope people would think they're mutually exclusive kids will learn to meet deadlines and to be compliant as they need to they will learn school savvy to play the game in the system. They will do that with a lot of this other knowledge base and how do you cultivate executive function, self-efficacy and so on. So don't think we're like, oh, we don't really care. That's not important. It is, you better make a deadline. And by golly, I have a highly effective way to teach it to you. And it's not your punitive gotcha. And that's the mindset. We've got, we've got four rock stars waiting to come in and just kind of 
uh, chime into the conversation, Rick, if we could. I'd sure. love to bring them on, Chris, if you could at this point in time. Love Absolutely. to hear their feedback. Let's go ahead and uh, I'll bring them in in order uh, that I've got on my screen here. No particular order, uh, anyone, but uh, I've got Tracy Ide coming in to join us. Tracy Ide is an English language arts educator in uh, seventh grade, former special educator, uh, all star and rock star in terms of social emotional learning. Uh, we've got Stacy Garrity, English language arts and science over at Charlton Middle School. Maggie Herrick, grade seven ELA here at Dudley Middle School. And Todd Peliquin, grade seven. Thank you. English language arts over at Charlton Middle. How are you all doing tonight? Hey, Tracy, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Very welcome, Stacy. Well, great to see you on screen. How are you? I'm great. We'll a little time delay there, Thank I think. you for having me. All right, it's our pleasure. Todd, it's great to see you down there in the corner. How are you tonight? Fabulous. How couldn't you be fired up after listening to Rick speak? <laughs> I know, right? Maggie, how are you today? Great. The storms are dying down, I think. so. so good. They're <laughs> ramping up here. I've got driving rain. I can't even see my car in the parking lot anymore. Uh, it's, it's coming down pretty good. Cats and dogs. So, uh, Tracy, um, since you're up in the top corner next to Rick, what are some of your thoughts on what you heard tonight relative to your practice and uh, moving forward this school year? Um, I loved what you said, Rick. I, um, you know, my uh, my main focus in my classroom, and I, you know, much of it comes from having been a special education teacher for so many years um, is really meeting kids where I find them and building the connection that I need to with the struggling learners and, and talking about equity, you know, um, the type of feedback I think is differentiated for what kind of learner we're, we're dealing with. There's feedback that is going to bring them forward in the curriculum. And then there are our struggling kids who need feedback still in the middle levels to move from being that upper elementary school student to the lower uh, junior high school student. And so I feel like there needs to be constant feedback um, in order to shape that student into some of them just still need to be shaped into a student with the expectations of the you know the lower um junior high school classroom and then we have kids that are come come to us and they are ready to go and they need that feedback to move them to the next level of their ability to perform as you know an, an upper middle school lower um junior high school student so there is equity in that in my classroom, no one flies under the radar. Um, feedback is constant. And whether you are that struggling learner that I, I see you, I see you, whether you're, you know, you're up here and I need to be pushing you and pushing that threshold and having the higher expectation and saying, I see what you did. You're on the right page. I think that there's more here. What do you think? Um, and then you have the student who, I see you, I see that maybe you didn't eat breakfast today. So come on over here and let me help you out, you know? So I think that equity there, but differentiating, the equity for me is that the feedback is constant, but I see you, whoever you are, um, and just letting them know that. And for some kids, the, you know, the connection they have with me is going to be their starting place for motivation. It isn't going to be excelling or progressing in the curriculum because they're not there yet. They don't care about the curriculum yet, but they care about the fact that I care about them. So if I can really build that connection and make that really strong, that's my jumping off place for motivating them into the curriculum. They care that Mrs. Ide sees me and wants me to succeed. And hopefully through that, they will start to internalize and want to succeed themselves. 
That connection is absolutely what we're talking about, Trace. Thank you so much for sharing your style and perspective. Uh, Todd, you, 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 you came in after I introduced you and said you were fired up in jazz. What's the, what's the number one thing that's going to drive you out of this conversation? Well, before Todd goes, if I could, if, uh, Todd, I, I got to do the uh, lead in for you, Chris. As much as I want you to take care of that, let me just talk about Todd and Stacey. Talk out Todd, first. Todd, Todd, Todd really subscribes to the philosophy of the redos, retakes. Uh, nothing is ever to the level to where he believes that, uh, that the kids have totally got it until the end. It just keeps going back and they really get into the process. So Todd, I, I, I highly uh, recognize you for that. You're very good at it. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that means to you? Yeah, like we spend a lot of time early on in my class talking about the need for feedback and how feedback makes all of us better. Like, I don't get better as a teacher if I don't get feedback from my peers who have experience. If I don't get feedback from Dean, if I don't get feedback from others, I don't grow. That's part of a growth mindset. And I want to bring that to the students, too. I want them to understand that, that feedback is it's a gift and it's the most essential gift if we want to get better, because as has been said several times here, there's always another level. There's always another gear. It's not like Michael Phelps doesn't get feedback on his swimming or Steph Curry doesn't get feedback on his jump shot. They do. And that's why they excel to the level that they excel to. So I think retakes play a massive role in that. Students have to feel like they can improve their work. If they don't feel that, they'll never take an academic risk. They'll always play it safe because they're going to always be looking at being hurt by trying something new. If you want students to take an academic risk, you have to give them the opportunity when they miss, when they mess up, when there's a mistake, to go back and fix it. And that's what's going to drive them to take your feedback and to go to another level. It's an essential part of what we do as educators. It's an essential part of what we do anywhere in the world if we want to see people excel to the maximum of their possible capability. Todd, you're, you're, you're 100% spot on. And I, I think that the, the language that you just used around risk taking and encouraging kids to go to that next level is uh, exceptionally important. Uh, Maggie, um, this past year, you and Tracy collaborated on a project that put yourselves out there with risk. Um, can you talk a little bit about student motivation and a, a general summary of what that project was? Absolutely. So um, actually, it was one day. Um, I have two co-taught classrooms, and I had a student that kept coming up to me with these comics. And... Um, just he really wanted to submit that for work instead of you know the ela work that was for the day and so he said to me could i could i show this to mr star and i said oh of course and then he said could you put this in our school newspaper and so i was later on collaborating with tracy and tracy's like wait a minute we don't have a school newspaper like that would be awesome and so we took this idea and we were like, let's take both of our ELA classes and bring them together as much as possible and create a school newspaper and get this student's work in there. And, um, you know, we told them at the end, we're like, hey, you're the whole reason why we did this. And so we got the, the classrooms together. And um, I think what goes along with this is our we do our peer editing and Tracy and I work on that throughout the entire year, especially with my co-taught classrooms. Some of those kids, you know, they do feel insecure when they're given a paper done by somebody else. And they don't immediately sit down and think, oh, I have something to contribute to this. And so Tracy and I have work all year and we print out like four or five copies of each article that our students have written and we pass them out and they go through and they do these, um, peer editing sessions to prep everything for the Titan Times, which is what it was named. And it was a complete, completely done by our students this year. And we were so excited by it. We can't wait to do it again this year. We have to figure it out how we're going to do it um, remotely or through hybrid. But it was awesome. And it was so great. And just to see the kids to get involved in that way and to pick 
literally anything that they want to talk about and go research it and write an article on it. Or maybe it was artwork that they did or a comic or photography. And that was just so amazing to watch them get so excited. Some kids that had, you know, we would have to really push them to write two sentences are writing these huge articles about, you know, how the school needs better toilet paper. And they're interviewing, you know, like why the toilet paper is no good in our school. And it's, it was just so exciting to see that. You know, the, the idea that, that you uh, collaborated and created this um, experience for student writing, uh, where it really encapsulates all the ideas of uh, peer editing, uh, feedback, uh, sharing perspective, life skills around public speaking and interviewing. It, it provided kids with a, a, an authentic opportunity to, to really develop an authentic voice. Uh, and I, I really think that you you struck on, on our themes of this evening with that project. Thanks very much for sharing. Uh, Dean. And Maggie, you, you broke from the traditional mindset of educating in a classroom. You really took a risk. That's fantastic. I'm very proud of you. That's good stuff. Now, Stacy, you know, oftentimes I will walk through that class in relationships are the number one thing when it comes to creating a good learning environment. Stacy, you and your teammates do a wonderful job with that. Talk a little bit about how that plays into the ability for all students to be able to feel good about learning and to be able, able to uh, meet those uh, learning goals. Absolutely. Um, we really strive to learn who our students are, especially in the beginning of the year. Um, and I know this year will be different than any, you know, starting remote, so we're already trying to brainstorm some new ways. But the minute you start asking them questions outside, you know, what do you know from multiplication tables, know about a plant, but hey, what are you doing in your spare time? Oh, you like that? Oh, guess what? I like that too. And you make those strong relationships with kids. It was like Tracy was saying, and they know that you're invested in them. And then they want to invest back with you. And I find that that's strong, you know, even after 22 years of being in the classroom, that's one of my strengths that I'm really proud of building those relationships. And I know when we did go remote abruptly in March, having those strong relationships brought kids to my live sessions, you know, they were there. They remembered that I still cared. I made those phone calls. I reached out to them. I wanted them to know they weren't on their own island. Um, and whether you're starting remote or you're in person, I think it's so important that they know that you care for them, that you're invested in them. And then from there, the learning happens. It's just, you need that strong foundation. Boom, right on. Yeah, I think you hit it right down the middle of the fairway. Um, absolutely. Rick, any thoughts on what you heard from our teachers? Well, all, all very impressive. And I, I'm struck by, as we started out, um, several African cultures, of which I'm aware, use this idea of I see you as a way to show respect as we first started out. And I would wonder if a teacher could say, here's how my students know that I see them and then accept them as they are, not as I perceive they should be. But here right now, you are golden and time in your company is time well spent. And I think also teachers are very stressed out because they have a learning curve of technology if they're doing remote or hybrid. But if you all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, that whole idea. And I think if you have a really wide repertoire of building relationships or the tiering and scaffolding according to readiness, how do we teach a variety of readiness levels simultaneously? And this person needs feedback like this. Like I, I, one of my favorite forms of feedback is just putting a dot at the end of a sentence or in the math algorithm where there's an issue, but no explanation what's going on or highlighting it, many of you know, and that you have to do the heavy lifting yourself. But some kids might need a one word clue. So I'm gonna tier and scaffold my, tiering, my feedback for them as well, but I'm gonna get better at tiering, at teaching simultaneously and better at scaffolding for those who need that. And one of the coolest things you can do is this voice. And I think this the school newspaper where we get you know really good articles from kids and how they're handling pandemic things and some of their passions, if we're all doing full-time remote instruction, is a great tool for connection. And say, oh, that person's coming to life. Maybe you got a picture. You could totally do that digitally. It would be so awesome. And maybe you do a click and there's a few you know links that were there's a video accompanying it, you know, hyperlinks and everything that really expands. And that paper could be much larger than it ever was before, much more robust and connective of all the students. So 
I'm, I have nothing but amazement and am very impressed with each of the ideas offered here. Thank you for to each of you. I'm going to very I, much. You know, uh, we, we, we always talk, or well, I always talk about that risk taking and, and, and pebbles falling down the side of the mountain or what start the avalanche. And, and these are the types of ideas that we really want to cultivate and expand upon and, and encourage others, you know, out there who may be watching us tonight, take that risk, go to your principal, go to your department head, talk to a colleague about a crazy idea because that crazy just might be the way to get your kids engaged and rethink teaching and learning. That's all the time we've got tonight, everybody. I'd like our guests and our panelists to stay on uh, after we end our live broadcast. Thanks to everyone who watched with us tonight at Unlock the Middle as we work very hard to bring new ideas, tips, and resources to you to really address middle-level teaching and learning. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Publicly, shout out, Mr. Rick Wormley. You nailed it tonight. Tracy Eide, Maggie Herrick, Stacey Garropy, Todd Pelliquin, both Dean and I really appreciate you being here and sharing your perspectives with us. Be well, everybody. Learn lots and get ready to tackle 2020-2021. Boom.